Ready to break free from algorithms, vanity PR, and money-sucking ads? My name's Larissa Worstiak, and I've learned in seven years of jewelry marketing that content is the crown jewel. My agency, Joy Joya, takes a holistic approach, leading with laser-focused storytelling, impactful content creation, and strategic content distribution. This method has worked for the solopreneur as well as the multi-million dollar company, and now I'm sharing these systems and tactics with you. Here's to standing out in a sea of sparkle. This is episode 229, and today I'll be building on the previous episode on content marketing in 228. I'll be explaining how you can generate audience personas to help you create the content that will naturally attract your target customer. As I mentioned in the last episode, content marketing is all about captivating the target customer right when they're in the perfect mindset to learn about your brand and your products. So you'll be learning how to identify who that person is, how to document their characteristics and needs for yourself and your team by checking out this episode. I'll be covering how is the audience persona different from your target market and how many personas do you need? What should this audience persona include and how the heck do you get this information? And how will you be able to apply these personas in your marketing? From now through early July of this year, I'm rolling out a free, yes, free six month podcast guided program called Jewelry Marketing Jumpstart which involves weekly audio and video lessons, as well as companion PDF downloads for each new episode. If you wanna sign up for the free full program right away and get the companion PDF download for this episode, visit joyjoya.com jump. Link in the show notes as well. But before we get to the solid gold, I'd like to take a moment to remind you that this podcast has both audio and video. So you can either listen on your favorite podcast platform or watch on YouTube by searching Joy Joya. You can support the podcast for free by taking the time not only to subscribe, but also to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. I want to read my favorite review of the week. J Ford Jewelry says, quote, I've just started listening and have immediately absorbed so many actionable points to help me navigate as I venture into opening a new business, end quote. Thank you and good luck on the new business. I hope this advice helps you. If you leave a review, I might read it on a future episode. So please let me know what you think about this one or tell me about any other major takeaways you've had recently. Okay, my sparklers, let's get into the next installment of Jewelry Marketing Jumpstart. And this one is all about audience personas for content marketing for your jewelry brand. If you want the companion PDF download for this episode, which is totally free, and you'll get all the other companion PDF downloads for this program, visit joyjoya.com slash jump. All right. Let's answer the question, how is the audience persona different from your target market and how many personas do you really need? So when you first sat down to write your business and marketing plan, hopefully, you likely came up with or had an idea about your target market, which refers to the group of customers who share demographic similarities that you've identified as the group of people who would be most likely to purchase your product. So you probably said something like, women between the ages of 40 and 50 who make a certain amount of money every year and they live in like this part of the world. Something kind of general like that. So how is that different from audience personas? So audience personas, which are also sometimes called buyer personas or customer personas, all the same thing, just slightly different terminology. They zoom in very specifically on one individual in your target market. They're more like archetypes of people who represent this greater target market that you hope to be serving. 
I personally like the term audience personas of those three terms I mentioned when I'm talking about content marketing because when you're making content for your target market like blog posts, video, audio, graphics, email campaigns, etc., they are really your audience in a way, the same way they might be an audience in a movie theater or at a concert because they're consuming your content and you also have to focus on doing things like entertaining them, informing them, building trust with them. So I particularly like thinking of them as audience personas. When you're creating your marketing content, you always want to be creating for an audience of one, not an audience of many. That is really hard for a lot of jewelry business owners to wrap their head around because the first like doubt or objection or fear that comes up when I say you need to be creating content for an audience of one is, but then I'm excluding so many other potential people who could be buying my product. But if you've listened to this podcast, you've probably heard me say this before. It's not my original quote, but it's very common, commonly said in marketing. When you're marketing to everyone, you're marketing to no one. So you really need to zoom in on who you want to be speaking to, who you think would resonate the most with your brand story and with what you have to offer. Without this level of specificity, you'll just never really understand how to speak in your marketing. If you struggle with storytelling in your brand, if you struggle with knowing what to say in your content, if you struggle with knowing what types of emails to send or what kind of content to post on social media, it's likely because you have not gotten clarity on who this audience persona is and you're not imagining them in your head every time you sit down to create a piece of content. That is typically the biggest challenge or mistake. And here's the thing, you can absolutely have more than one audience persona. So it doesn't have to just be one person. You can have a couple or a dozen or even more than that, and they can evolve over time, or you can add to your collection of audience personas over time, adjusting them and refining them as you gain more information in your business. But when you're just starting out or you've never done this exercise before, I'd try to really limit yourself to three so that you really can get that specific and focus and know exactly who you're speaking to. Try not to make more than that. Usually if you have an impulse to want to make more than that, then you're falling into that trap of trying to have broad mass appeal as a brand and you're not focusing specifically enough on the people who matter and who will absolutely be attracted to your brand and your products. Okay, so now that you understand why audience personas are so important and how many you should kind of focus on and how they need to guide your marketing, you're probably wondering what should an audience persona include? And then absolutely one of the most common questions I get is how, Larissa, do I get this information? I will tell you all the secrets. So. Personally, in Joy Joya, when I work with clients on audience personas, I have a specific list of things that I include in there. They're pretty standard. I would say if you Google audience or buyer or customer personas, you'll find some kind of variation of what I'm about to say. And you may even wanna do a Google search and look at other examples because maybe um, there will be things that resonate more with you. So don't take this as a be all end all. But I think this is a really great start, especially if you've never done this before. So, of course, you want to have basic demographic information, things like age. Usually it's a range, or maybe it could be one specific 
age, but if it's a range, I would keep it small, like five years. Um, family status, so are they married? Are they single? Do they have children? What is that family dynamic like? Where are they located? What's their education and occupation? What is the combined household income? I then like to just have like a three to four sentence, like paragraphish long summary of that gives an overview of this person. So if you were gonna invite them um, with you to a party and you're gonna tell the host, oh, I'm bringing my friend so-and-so and this is what you should know about them. Like, what would you tell another person to introduce them? That I really like to put in the summary. Then I usually have three to four bullet points about their interests and values. So like, what are their hobbies? What things are really important to them? What is their passion? Like, what lights them up? What keeps them up at night? Just have some summary bullet points of that. Then maybe some four to five personality traits. So these are usually just adjectives that describe how this person is, like introverted, extroverted, passionate, um, family oriented, things like that. A really brief description of a day in the life of this person. So like from the beginning of their day to the end of the day, what is their typical routine? Do they go to the gym? Do they spend their day in an office? Are they at home like caring for children? Are they traveling a lot? Some things like that. Their social media and digital habits. So like when they do take out their phone, for example, what's the app that they immediately open? How much time do they spend on it? Are they on email a lot? Do they check email on their phone or at a desk? Do they sit at a desk all day? So that's where they do most of their digital interactions. Also their influences. So do they pay attention to trends? Are they influenced by their coworkers, their family members, their friends? Do they read magazines? Do they like follow people on TikTok? Do they pay attention to advertising? Who is getting them to buy things? Or maybe they, they are just marching to the beat of their own drum. Also their shopping habits their needs and their frustrations. So when it comes to shopping for jewelry and accessories or anything at a similar price point to what you sell, how often are they shopping for these items? Once a month, once a quarter, only around special holidays or occasions? Um, how are they shopping? Are they going into a store? Are they buying online? Do they tend to buy a lot of stuff and then return some of it? What are the common habits this person has with shopping? What do they really need? Do they need to interact with the salesperson? Do they need to have a great like return or shipping policy? Are they interested only in like legacy brands? Whatever you think this person needs to make a purchase. And then some frustrations. So what are their like pet peeves about shopping? Do they hate when a website like doesn't work well on their phone or when things are listed as final sale or something like that. What are the things that really like peeve them about shopping and will keep them from buying or possibly make them change their mind about buying something? And then if this person was to buy from you, which products or collections would they gravitate to the most and why? This is important to have because if you have multiple audience personas, like let's say three, all three of those people might gravitate toward different things within your assortment. And then lastly, I like to put brand affinities. So what are the brands that this person loves, is super loyal to, they love getting their email campaigns, like very regularly, They're, they'll treat themselves to something new from these brands. They like, know, and trust these brands. I think it's nice to list about three or four of those. So when I'm going through all these points, it probably sounds almost like I'm building a character for a book or a movie. In some ways, it might even feel fictional like a creative writing exercise. So you probably wanna know, where do you get the information or the data to kind of 
create these personas? How do you make them up without just creating them out of nothing, out of your imagination? So definitely through data that you already have available, it could be demographic info that you have through your sales platform, through Google Analytics web traffic, and through social media analytics, any info that you have from any past sales data. It could be anecdotal data from any in-person events you do, like trunk shows or other events, or from your sales team if you have that. If you also have retail partners, it would be great to speak to them about the types of customers on their sales platforms or in their stores that are gravitating toward your products. You can do surveys, you can do interviews with your best or VIP customers, or you can work with like a market research firm to conduct some more in-depth research. So what should you do if you're truly starting from scratch and you don't even have any of that data? Which is totally a reasonable question. If you're a startup and you got nothing to work from, how are you supposed to create audience personas? Well, first you should definitely still do it. And there are ways to do this without just totally guessing. You can make what I think are more educated guesses. And there, there are, are some ways to get data that will help you. You could read market research reports related to the jewelry industry. You can find influencers or other people on social media who you think would represent your target customer and then build your personas around them and what you see related to their behavior and their traits. You can ask friends, acquaintances who may represent your target customer. You can look at competitors, especially at competitors' social media presence. Who are the people following them? What do they look like on social media? What do you kind of see with their behaviors? You can attend different industry events, go to trunk shows, go to retail partners who may potentially carry your product and spend some time there and see who is shopping. So it's definitely possible to create audience personas even if you think you have nothing to work from. So once you have these audience personas made, how can you actually apply this to your marketing? So definitely in future episodes, I will be very much deep diving into this. I will be referring to audience personas again and again, very regularly, because they really are the foundation for all your content and your marketing. Basically, any time that you create a new content asset or any type of marketing campaign, you're going to think about how it speaks to the audience personas and if it's going to be effective in getting that specific person to take the action you want them to take, whether that's to look at your new collection, place an order for a holiday, schedule an appointment to design something custom, visit you at a trunk show, etc. You'll also be able to use data from your marketing and your sales to go back and refine the audience personas as you move forward. So ultimately the two are like a feedback loop that will help you continually speak more specifically to the person who absolutely matters, the person who will adore your brand and products. Okay, that's all about audience personas for now. Much more to come in future episodes. Go to joyjoya.com slash jump for additional info, action items, and exercises related to this episode, including a template for creating your very first audience persona. Before we get into the gold mine, as well as my jewelry marketing news roundup, I want to share a case study of a jewelry brand that I think embodies everything I just spoke about. So these are my thoughts about how I'd apply this lesson to a jewelry brand in the wild. Disclaimer, this brand is not a current client. This week's case study is Katie Dean Jewelry a US-based jewelry brand that specializes in delicate jewelry that's perfect for layering. So I've been looking around for examples of jewelry brands that are effectively taking advantage of content marketing 
And in the process of doing this, I stumbled upon Katie Dean. Since Joy Joya doesn't work with this brand, I'm only speculating on their audience personas. But if I had to guess, based on the product and the marketing, I'd say this is an older Gen Z or millennial customer who has laid back, minimal effort, glam style, and appreciates delicate pieces that offer just the right amount of sparkle and polish for everyday wear. This person's very social, loves going out with girlfriends for brunches and happy hours. She also loves being creative, whether that's in her creative career or after hours with a creative hobby. Three things that she's always seeking in life are comfort, ease, and sophistication. I came upon a recent blog post the brand published on their e-commerce website, and I'll link that in the show notes if you'd like to see, about Galentine's Day and how to plan the perfect party to celebrate your favorite Galentines. The post shared photos from a Galentine's event and the, that the brand had hosted in 2017 as the inspiration for all the ideas that they talk about. They advise the event should have florals, beverages, sweet treats, handmade touches, gift bags, and more. At very first glance, the post has nothing to do with the Katie Dean product and only has to do with providing readers with a fun party idea for Galentine's. But actually, when you look at it more closely, Product and brand are referenced a number of times throughout the post, including as an idea for a gift to put in a Galentine gift bag. I thought this idea was very cute and perfect for the audience persona I just described a few moments ago, who may be inspired by this instructional blog post or even feel aspirational, like this may be something she wants to do in the future. If I had one suggestion for the brand, I'd probably make the post even longer and more in depth, but maybe that's something they can do in the future, updating and adding to it and then repurposing it for future Galentine's days. What are some topics that you think would resonate with and be fun for your audience persona? Again, you can check out the link to this blog post for yourself in the show notes and kind of see how Katie Dean approached their audience persona. Okay, let's get into the gold mine. So if you've been following this podcast, you know that I launched the gold mine in August as a secondary episode this week, but now I'm doing the gold mine as a segment in this weekly Sunday podcast. This week's topic is all about reframing complaints to have a more positive and fun experience in your business overall. I thought of this topic last week because it relates to something I was going through in my own business and I wanted to share my personal experience which will hopefully resonate with you. So depending on how much of the sales part of your business you personally handle, you may or may not be able to relate to my specific example Like maybe you take on a lot of custom work, so you have to do one-to-one sales with your custom jewelry clients, or maybe you sell to retail partners, so you have to conduct sales correspondence with buyers and jewelry store owners. But even if you don't do sales, there's probably something in your business, some kind of task or thing you have to do in order to keep your business functioning that you secretly or not so secretly hate and complain about, maybe to other people or just to yourself, maybe you feel grumbly about it. And I know that sales just happens to be the thing that people complain about a lot, especially if they're not natural salespeople. So that's why I'm kind of using this example. But as I'm talking, think about the thing in your business that you're like, I would rather not do this, but for now, I just have to do it. So in my business, one thing I don't love, or now I'm gonna change my mindset about it, but that I have not loved is following up a lot. 
I joke that at least 50% of my work is just following up with people, whether that's current clients or prospective clients. It's just part of project managing. It's part of being able to move forward with sales. And even though I'm super organized and I can check in with people, it does get exhausting sometimes. It feels like I'm in a big room with lots of people and I'm just walking around, tapping everyone on the shoulder like, excuse me, excuse me, I need this, pay attention to me, excuse me. I don't love doing that, but it's something that I really have to do in my business. So what is the thing for you that feels that way? It might be following up, it might be something else. But anyway, last week I found myself getting especially grumbly about having to follow up. Like, ugh, why do I have to follow up so much? Because it can be kind of tiring to stay on top of things like that. It requires me to be super diligent and proactive and laser focused. But I realized in that moment of complaining to myself in my head that I'm the only one responsible for putting myself in this negative frame of mind. And because of the fact that I'm complaining and allowing myself to get into a bad mood about it, I'm taking joy and happiness out of my workday that I could very easily reclaim if only I could just change my attitude. So I was trying to think about this a little more and I remember someone once said to me, Larissa, when you follow up, you're providing a service because you're reminding people of something they need or could benefit from. And then there are sometimes even people who thank me for following up with them. So I thought of those two things. I sat back and realized that even though, yes, following up can be very tedious sometimes, I'm doing something good. I'm offering value. And I decided I don't want to feel annoyed about following up anymore. So I got out a post-it note and I wrote on it, I'm providing a valuable service by following up and I'm grateful for the opportunity to connect with people in this industry with the goal of helping them grow their businesses. I put that on a post-it note, I stuck it on my computer monitor, and I'm gonna look at this every time I have to email or call someone because it reminds me that I'm providing value, a valuable service. And it helps me just reframe a moment that I otherwise would would have been grumbly about. So if you don't do sales, what's something, and that's not a point of a pain point for you, what's something in your business that really makes you grumbly? Like every time you sit down to do it, you whine and complain to yourself and wish you didn't have to. I invite you to try to reframe the thought by maybe rewriting it in a positive way and putting it on a post-it note. I think it really helps to look at that task uh, from a mindset of gratitude. Like, is there any way you can feel grateful for the opportunity to do this thing? And then put that post-it note somewhere you can see and see if it eliminates that tiny bit of annoyance. Another person recently suggested to me maybe also pair that annoying activity with something you like. So let's say you really enjoy sitting down to have your cup of coffee every morning. Maybe also look forward to doing that thing you don't like doing while you're having that cup of coffee or while you're listening to like your favorite podcast. So it kind of takes away some of the bad (laughs) energy around it. Anyway, tell me in a YouTube comment or podcast review if you can relate to this. Do you let yourself get caught up in the cycle of complaining about things in your business? Do you think you'd benefit from some reframing? I'd love to hear how you handle this situation. All right, let's talk about some news related to jewelry or marketing. And you can find the links to these articles in the show notes. So the first article comes from theverge.com and it's called BuzzFeed says it will use AI tools from OpenAI to personalize its content. So in last week's episode, I mentioned ChatGPT, which is a free AI tool that writes authentic and sophisticated content for pretty much anything you might ask it. 
And I'm bringing it up again because I think, and I said this last week too, I think it's going to be very relevant to the future of content creation very soon, like yesterday. So you need to be paying attention to it if you're going to move forward on this content marketing journey. And I will continue talking about these things in future episodes. So the media organization BuzzFeed recently announced that it will leverage tools like ChatGPT to enhance and personalize its content, according to the CEO, Jonah Peretti. So quote, it will be enhancing the quiz experience, informing our brainstorming, and personalizing our content for our audience. He says it opens up a new era of creativity where creative humans like us play a key role in providing the ideas, cultural currency, inspired prompts, IP, and formats that come to life using the newest technologies. My main takeaway is that I completely agree with what he said. I think tools like ChatGPT open up a world of possibility for marketers who constantly need to generate creative content and come up with new ideas that can be super time consuming. Think about it, if an AI tool can help you save time in say the brainstorming process or even in the refinement process, then you can become a better brand storyteller and improve your success in reaching your target customers with your marketing. The next article comes from Skyward and they are a really major marketing agency that specializes in content. So they shared a blog post called The Risks and Rewards of Using Generative AI for Content Creation, What Brand Marketers Need to Know. Speaking of AI, <laughs> I wanted to go through this article because even though you may not be at the point where you feel comfortable using AI in your marketing, it's really good to inform yourself. So by AI, I mean ChatGPT, which I just mentioned, and other tools like Dolly, which specializes in generating images based on text prompts. What are the limitations of these tools? Where can they maybe not be perfect. So it can potentially make up facts that it presents with full confidence. It does not cite sources. It doesn't work with real-time information. It can potentially present bias, pre prejudice, and misinformation. And it cannot apply critical thinking like human beings. So it's not perfect by any means, but those things shouldn't deter you from finding ways to make those tools work for you. So then what are the good things? You can use these tools to generate ideas and topics. You can use them to help you with an outline of subtopics. You can get a quick draft of something to kind of help you get started in the writing process. You can find alternate ways of phrasing that would be great for email and social media copy. You can use these tools to help you write something in a specific tone. So let's say you need to know how to write this email, but I need to speak to like Gen Z women. It can potentially help you achieve the tone that will best resonate with the target audience. And it can help you refresh content for readability and engagement. One super interesting point in this article is the prediction that in the future consumers will expect and want even more tailoring and personalization and marketing since it will become more normalized thanks to AI technology. So what's my main takeaway? Hey, just try the tool ChatGPT for yourself. It's free, it's relatively easy to use, and see what you can come up with. Experiment with having it optimize some email marketing or social media copy for you, and then you can get an idea of what it's capable of doing. And the last article comes from CMS Wire, and it's called Five Ways to Make Your Marketing Emails More Personal Without Personalization. So if you are not ready to embrace personalization or you don't have enough data about your email subscribers to fully personalize your emails, or you don't wanna take advantage of the technology you would need to do so 
you can still take steps to make the emails feel more personal. I really loved these tips and I think they're easy for brands at any level to implement. So the first tip is write from your customer's perspective. That means avoiding the me, me, me sentiment and focusing on what the customer would want or benefit from. Even the language you're using in an email can reflect that. So try to skip to the benefits the subscriber will get rather than pushing your own agenda and always just talking about your own brand. Use connection-based language, which means using words like your, you, we, and our, helping build stronger relationships with the people on the other side receiving your emails. Do the exercise, exercise of counting how many times you use I, me, our, us, our product, our company name, etc., and try to cut down on having such a strong focus on your own brand, or at least balancing it out so it's between us and you rather than just me, me, me all the time. You can also make the subscriber feel like they're part of a group or community and be more conversational in your language. My main takeaway is leading your emails with content can help you naturally get away from that me, me, me approach because then it's not always so focused on product, 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 buy me, buy me, buy me. So doing things like linking to blog posts in your emails or mentioning texts texts from a recent piece of content in an email is more focused on delivering value to the subscriber rather than on sharing your own agenda. Did you have any questions about Jewelry Marketing Jumpstart? You can always email me Larissa, that's L-A-R-Y-S-S-A at joyjoya.com. If you love this podcast, please share it with a friend who'd appreciate it. And don't forget to subscribe as well as leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're completely new to digital marketing, then you'll want to purchase and read a copy of my book, Jewelry Marketing Joy. You can visit joyjoya.com book for more information.